So I'm not sure how many talks we have in July. It will be either one or two. And, uh, and now I am very glad to welcome uh, Jotam Handel and uh, announce his talk. And announce his talk on a number theoretic characterization of FRS morphisms, uniform estimates of finite rings of the form Z mod P to the KZ. Please, your time. Okay. And one more thing I'm sharing link to the slides. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. And then hopefully you will not lose yeah. it. So, um, please. Yeah, okay, so I see it here. Um, okay, so thanks for the invitation, for the opportunity to speak. Uh, today I will talk about um, a project joint with uh, Itai Glaser, which is here, and Raf Clackers. And actually this is started when Raf Clackers was vid visiting the Weizmann Institute about here and something ago. I can't really remember all this, with all this corona business around time is something very fluid. And so I guess I, I should take, thank the Weizmann Institute for that as well. And to start off this talk, um, I want to recall the long whale bounds. And the setting is as follows. So given a finite type Z scheme X, we want to count the number of solutions of, um, of the system of equations over finite fields. And the long whale estimates tell us that um, essentially this quantity is controlled by the dimension of the scheme. Um, so more formally, if X is a finite type Z scheme as above, and I let CXP denote the number of uh, geometric, geometrically reducible top dimensional components of X FP bar, which are defined over FP, then I have a constant independent of P such that this um, normalized quantity, the number of points of X over FP divided by p to the power dimension of x um, minus uh, this number of um, irreducible components is um, bounded by c times p to the negative one half. And okay, so obviously this gives a very, a very nice um, grip on the number of fp points. And uh, in particular, it implies that this quantity, this um, normalized point count, is uniformly bounded as we vary the prime p. Okay. And I guess we can pack it in a cleaner way. Ah, and, and one more thing that I just want to recall is that this kind of makes sense because in an ideal world, we would expect varieties to behave like um, a fine space of the same dimension and fine space of dimension dim xq has exactly p to the power dm xq uh, points over fp. And yeah, I guess that's this piece of philosophy. And um, returning to pack this in a cleaner way, if I have a scheme x, then I define lowercase h of x of z mod pkz to be the normalized point count of x over uh, z mod pkz. So number of points of this x over um, divided by p to the power k d max. And in a similar fashion, as we studied the number of points of x over fp, we can do the same thing for x over uh, these finite rings. And the key question here is, and this will be the motivation for this talk. Firstly, what can I say about this quantity um, number of solutions, and secondly, is, the, is this Hx uniformly bounded when I vary both P and K, or maybe just one of them? Uh, any questions so far? Okay. So uh, let's see what can we say about this number of points over Z mod PKZ. And a good way to do this is to start with some examples. So in the case that X is a smooth scheme over Z, then by 
an analog of Hansel's lemma, I can lift any solution of x over fp to precisely p to the power k minus 1. Okay, can p to the power k minus 1 dmx solutions um, of x to the z modulo p k z. And therefore, this function Ajax of Z mod PKZ is really just the same as this function Ajax evaluated over um, finite field with P elements. In particular, just using the long wheel bounds, if I vary um, either P or K, then I get that this is uniformly, uniformly bounded. So this is one end of the spectrum. And if I go to the other extreme, I can take a very bad scheme, a non-reduced scheme, and say I take this one, um, z of x modulo x squared, then I get that the number of z mod, let's take z mod to the power, z modulo p to the power twice k, z just for simplicity, then there are p to the k such points and since the dimension of y is zero in this case, I get that this lowercase h of y is p to the power k, and this is not bounded, um, not in p and not in k. Okay, so on one hand, we have smooth schemes which behave very nice and the situation there is exactly the same as the situation over finite fields and uh, we have very bad schemes and there the situation is, is very bad. And in particular, this quantity is not bounded in either P nor K. And the question that one may ask is, can we characterize in some geometric way this property of uh, schemes X such that this Ajax function is uniformly bounded. Now, the answer to this question is positive. We can do that, but before I can show you how, I need another definition, and that is the definition of Russian singularities. And given some variety X, I say that X has rational singularities if X is normal and um, if for every resolution of singularities P from X tilde to X, the push forward of the structure shift of the resolving variety has no um, higher cohomologies. And maybe this is something which is not so easy to imagine. So let's see um, two examples. And actually, the second example is much more illuminating than the first. So a trivial example, a smooth scheme has rational singularities. I see. Okay, I'm telling you for, okay. Um, a smooth scheme has rational singularities. This makes sense. A more, um, an, an example which gives more information is the following. So consider the hypersurface defined by this sum of uh, x1 to the power n1 all the way up to xr to the power nr. So this guy defines a hypersurface in, in r-dimensional um, affine space. And one can show that this guy has rational singularities 
if and only if the sum of these inverses is strictly larger than one. And this in particular means that if you take something like x squared plus y squared equals zero, something like a cross, this doesn't have rational singularities. And as an, a more positive example, you can take um, something which I draw like a cone. If I choose my section properly, and uh, this guy has rational singularities. So, sorry, why isn't it three halves? So this is... Um, Ex exactly. What? Three halves is greater than one. Yeah, three halves is greater than one. And Even if, I know this. Yeah. So... Um, ah, okay, okay, sorry, sorry. That's the criterion for having it. Has Russian singularities if the sum of inverses is strictly greater than one. And now I can um, I can state the result I was referring to. And this is a result by um, Eisenbud and Avni from 2018. And also it is supplemented by a result by um, by Tai Glaser, which is which is here. And it says that if you take some fine types is scheme X, and also you assume that XQ is a local complete intersection and equidimensional, then having a uniformly bounded normalized number of points when I vary over, so uniformity in both P and K is uh, the same as having rational singularities. And this is the same as this difference of a normalized number of points over Z mod PKZ and normalized number of points over just FP being strictly smaller than um, some constant independent of P and K times P to the negative one. And to summarize, this means that for local complete intersection varieties, having rational singularities is the precise condition characterizing varieties such that this point counting function is uniformly bounded in P and K. Uh, any questions so far? Okay. So we can do this. Um, we have this characterization in the absolute case, in the case of just a scheme. And now the question is, can we go further and generalize this to the relative case, to the case of um, a morphism or the case of uh, solving um, a system of equations with some parameters? And, and here we consider a slightly altered version of this point counting function. And we denote it in a very similar way, like this x, y denotes just tells that this is um, my fiber. And I want to study this function. And when I do this, I always assume that xq and yq are smooth. And uh, for simplicity, I furthermore assume they are geometrically reducible. OK, so let's start out with uh, finite fields. And in that case, using a relative analog of the Langweil bounds, one can show that the precise condition to characterize um, uniform boundedness of this function now in, um, in P and in Y is for phi Q to be flat. And before I recall what is flatness, I just want to say one remark. Um, in this talk, I'm only, I only have like these FPs and Z to the Z modulo PKZ 
Um, on this slide, just for simplicity, we do everything in the generality, okay, in generality of just any fine field and any um, finite ring, which is a quotient of some ring of integers, but this is just a mess if you want to show it somehow. So that's the reason that here I'm only varying over this family of fine fields. And as I, okay, and, and as I promised, I also want to remind that um, a simple characterization for a morphism to be flat, a dominant morphism, so um, Zaritsky dense image, it is flat um, if and only if the dimension of its fibers are all the same, and I also need some assumptions, say X and Y are smooth and reducible. Um, so really having this quantity is uniformly bounded in Y and in P, if and only if all of the fibers of this morphism has, have the same dimension. Okay, so, so far so good. And I can do this for finite fields. Now I want to see what happens for um, the finite rings that we considered before, Z modulo PKZ. And from this theorem I showed you, you should be convinced that if I want to have any chance of uniformity in um, when varying over rings of the form Z, Z modulo PKZ, I need to assume that phi is flat. And furthermore, um, I will um, assume a relative version of the notion of Russian singularities. And this is something that I um, encode by um, the following notion. So if I have a morphism from X to Y to smooth varieties, I call it an FRS morphism. If it is a flat morphism, and um, its fibers have Russian singularities. So in a sense, the most simple mind and notion that you can define after moving to the relative case. And in order to show that a morphism is an FRS morphism, there is a very useful analytic criterion due to Eisenbud and Avni in their Inventionist paper from 2016. And I have it slightly reformulated here. And it says the following, so say you have some phi from X to Y, um, as usual morphism between Z schemes and X, Q and YQ are smooth varieties, then phi is FRS, if and only if for every prime P, you have some constant, this time depending on P, such that for every number K and every Y, this normalized point count function is uniformly bounded, but this time only in K and in Y. And another equivalent condition is that, um, and, and this is actually the condition that one usually uses when you want to show that something is FRS, is that for any local field F, um, non-Archimedean local field F of characteristic zero, um, and any, Schwarz measure, so any smooth and compactly supported measure on XF, the push forward of this measure has continuous density. So one can relate between um, the density of, of um, push forward of nice measures and this quantity here, this point count. And now the question that we try to answer is, can we render this, con this constant CP uniform in P. Now, um, this, is, this is something which is not so, um, this is something which is not so easy in general or maybe, okay, so maybe something that I want to say to give some context is that um, Igusa's conjecture on uh, exponential sums really deals with rendering a certain one can say similar constant uh, uniform in P. Um, so so this, this is some leap. And I guess to illustrate the situation, we will now draw a square. And I guess just to summarize, I can, um, 
put here the criteria absolute and here the criteria relative. And here I will write uh, non-uniform. Here uniform. And I guess this square is not very interesting. So if um, in the absolute case, which is uniform, then we have um, the work I mentioned by Eisenbund Avdin, this is from 2018. And in the relative, but non-uniform case, so uniform in K and in Y, but not in P, we have the work of Eisenbund and Avni from 2016. And we show the case, which is both uniform in P, Y, and K. And um, okay, the relative case, which is uniform in P, Y, and K. Um, any questions before I formulate the main theorem? Okay. And this goes as follows. So um, say phi is a dominant morphism between uh, fine type Z schemes and XQ and YQ are smooth and geometrically reducible as before. Then the following are equivalent. One, phi Q is FRS. Um, two, there exists some um, absolute constant independent of PK and Y such that this point counting function normalized, the normalized point counting function is uniformly bounded by C. And uh, three, this difference between these normalized point counting functions is uh, bounded by some constant independent on, uh, independent of K, Y, and P times P to the negative one. So really instead of the CP, we now, we can now take uh, just see here and um, yeah, and, and by the way, this theorem that I mentioned above, right here, so it shows that this function is bounded, but it doesn't really tell you too much about, like it, it's not as, um, as quantitative in the sense that you can't really say how, how the density looks like, like how uh, this, this point count function looks like or how this density looks like. Okay. Um, okay, so this is the main result that I wanted to present. And now, ah. And one more thing I want to say is that uh, we also proved some number theoretic characterizations of some additional classes of morphisms. Um, okay, if this looks like something interesting, then I, I encourage you to go and check. And the rest of, um, of this talk, I will talk about the proof and this will take us to talking about model theory for some time and hopefully I get to sketch the proof of the hard part of the main theorem. Any questions so far? Okay. Um, so now we want to prove the main theorem. We have some FRS morphism. We want to show that um, the normalized point counting function is uniform in P, Y, and K. And because our morphism is FRS, it is in particular flat and fibers of flat maps are local complete intersections. And furthermore, each fiber has Russian singularities. So um, it puts us in the framework of the absolute case and one can wonder whether we can just um, generalize the absolute case. But um, looking more carefully at the absolute case, it see, we see that um, Resolution singularities together with a certain formula of the NEF are used very heavily and this doesn't have a relative satisfactory behavior. And this, this formula of the NEF, so it allows you to calculate the number of Z mod PKZ points of, uh, of a scheme 
using um, the use okay if you have you have a resolution singularities and use the, res the resolution data and some um, some point count of some constructible sets over FP to calculate the Z modulo PKZ points of your scheme and this doesn't move too well to the relative analog and therefore in order to show uniformity nonetheless we we use model theory and the philosophy here is that um, many of the functions both in representation theory and in number theory are not some functions that you take off the street and more, more precisely many of them are defined by um, a certain first order language and um, I guess here I have so here I have the language of rings for example and it contains uh, symbols uh, for constants zero and one and symbols for binary operations also symbols for variables and also all the logical symbols so and and all and implies and all quantifiers and so on and given some language we can write some formulas and then evaluate these formulas in fields to get some sets so for example I can take I can write the formula psi f y um, let's say there exists x such that x squared equals y so this defines all squares and now if I plug in a ring to this formula say maybe fp then this gives rise to a set so all x in fp such that x is square and in the language of rings I can um, more or less express all of algebraic geometry or certainly a very large part of it now the language that I will use is the DNF pass language which has three sorts of variables and um, these sorts are as follows so I have um, a sort for the valued field and you should think about this as something like UP and it has the language of rings and I have a sort for the residue field and you should think about this as something like FP and also I will denote it as KF in, in what follows and okay to prevent confusion I erase this and also I have a sort for the value group and you should think about this as Z so this is the the group to where my evaluation goes and it is endowed with the language with the Pressburger language so this is a Pressburger this is a language on order abelian groups and the interesting thing is that it has congruence as modulo n so I can say something like um, well a is congruent to b modulo 2 and so on and so forth so I can I can define arith arithmetic progressions these are definable in, in this language and in addition to these sorts I also have two function symbols valuation and angular component which I just think about as the valuation going from QP to Z and by an angular component map I just mean the map that takes the first term in IPadic expansion so if I have something like um, P cubed times uh, 2 plus 5 P to the power uh, 4 then this returns this two guy any questions Q QP without zero the valuation goes right or uh, yeah QP without zero mm -hmm. or if I want to add zero then I should okay. add infinity but I mean, yeah, yeah thanks, infinity, I thanks. 
And um, okay, so I have this language and I can write a whole bunch of formulas and another piece of notation that I want to include is uh, this notation of log large large, I guess. And this just denotes, so this just comes instead of writing, um, so f in log lar large large is the same as um, f, let me write this properly, same as there exists some number such that f is a non-archimedian local field um, of residual characteristic larger than m. And the reason that I take this notation is because um, usually you want to consider non-archimedian local fields with residual characteristic large enough, but this large enough changes as I, um, as I prove things and it grows larger and larger and Instead of um, doing all this bookkeeping on this M, I just um, have this piece of notation. And uh, now I'm ready to define um, definable sets and definable functions. And if I have some field F, then I denote by KF its residue field and by QF the um, size of this residue field. And now I say that the collection X of subsets of F to the power N1 times KF to the power N2 times Z to the power N3 is a definable set if it is defined using, using one LDP formula. So this is something like the, collect, the collection of all, all squares. Um, something like this collection, so X in F such that um, X is a square. This collection is a, forms a definable set. And now if I have a collection of functions, then I say that it is a definable functions, a de definable function from a definable set X to a definable set Y, given that the collection of its graphs is a definable set. So if I have this um, FF from XF to YF, I can consider the collection of graphs. And if this guy is a definable set, then I say that my function is a definable function. And um, any, any questions before I go on to examples? Okay, so some examples. I guess first example, um, the collection of all rings of integers is a definable set and this is defined just using the formula. Um, val x larger than zero. And now if I have some finite type Z scheme, I can actually interpret it as an LDP definable set. Just I have some system of equations and I can solve it in any field that I like. And in addition, I can also do something as follows, so I can take a definable set where XF is given by the valuation is congruent to zero modulo two and the angular component is one. And in that case, I just get something of the form. So if pi is the uniformizer, I get pi F to the power twice K times one plus pi OF. So this is something which is definable, some piece of, of periodic space. And these are definable sets and some examples for definable functions are um, as follows. So I can take a polynomial, the valuation of a polynomial 
and the angular component of a polynomial. I can also take the collection of indicators um, of x where x is a definable set. Okay, obviously this is a definable function. The graph is a definable set. And therefore, I can look at the collection of all indicators of x of f, where O f is the ring of integers of f, and this is a definable function as well. So this collection of uh, definable sets and definable functions is a very rich collection, and it is very useful. A lot of the things that we want to deal with are here, but uh, it has one major drawback, and that is that it is not uh, preserved under integration. You might integrate some definable function and end up with something which is not definable. For example, if you have um, some collection of varieties, some, um, say you just have a map from A2 to A1, and now you define, you want, um, you want to integrate over just the zip, zip point. So this, okay, say this is defined over Z, then this gives you some phi from ZP squared to ZP. And then if you have um, some measure here, say even just the full measure here, you can push it forward. And you get something such that its density um, is defined as this integral. So something like um, one, and here let's say I have some, uh, some relative measure. And this is no longer definable. And for that reason, I need to define a slightly larger collection of functions, which I call motivic function functions. And yeah, and, and by the way, to be, I guess, more precise, you can take here something like uh, the absolute value of the gelfand lerey form or something like that. But the gist is that you can integrate a definable function and get something which is not definable. And this is an... Now I, I will define a class which solves this problem, and this is called the class of motivic or constructible functions. So say we have some definable set X, and I will define the ring of motivic functions C of X as um, the ring of all functions, which are collections of these, of these like F, lowercase f, and this f lowercase f can be one of the following generators. So I can take a definable function with integer values. I can take q to the power of um, some definable function with integer values. I can take any constant of this form, one over one minus q to the power ai, where ai are um, negative integers. And um, also I can take some function of the following form. I take, uh, so I have some definable set, subset of xf times um, this finite field kf to the power r. And then I just take the fiber over a given x to be all y in kf to the power r such that xy is in ZF, and then I count the number of points that I get here. So, so really, this this is my way to, um, I guess, to put arithmetic into the picture. And this generator is all about counting points over um, finite fields. And um, now I guess, okay, so there are some examples. Any questions about this before I continue?
Okay, hopefully this is not too confusing. Uh, okay, so some examples. Firstly, any of the generators I've mentioned uh, above is a motivic function. And also, if I have um, somorphism from x to y, um, and I take this normalized point counting function, but say over um, a finite over, over the residue field, then this collection forms a motivic function as well. Actually, even if I take it over um, finite rings instead, like over something like um, OF modulo uh, maximal ideal to some power, then it will still be a motivic function, but just for simplicity, um, because this like AJXY was just the size of the fiber normalized um, by this constant, and you see that this is really a motivic function because this guy just counts the number of solutions over um, a finite field in this case, because here I just used the finite fields. And as an interesting non-example, you can consider these functions. So one over the valuation of X, this is not a motivic function. And um, also, so, okay. So these kind of, these kind of um, I guess, phenomena that you don't have functions such as uh, this function in your collection really control, control a nice part of the behavior of motivic functions. So for example, motiv a motivic function which decays to zero must decay very fast. It cannot decay like um, one over log. So I think about valuation of X as kind of like log. Okay. And so, uh, so, uh, yeah. I have a question. So how do you see uh, this property? I mean, there, is there an easy way to see it? Like this non-example, this bound on, if it decays to zero, it must do it very fast. Th this is some, some result of- uh, Okay. Yeah, this is some Okay, okay. It's, it's not, not obvious, right? Okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, but really, if you look at these, you need okay. You need to say something. But if you look at these generators, then um, you really see that the thing which controls the decay is more or less these functions. Because if you plug in some some field f, and you want to see what happens as x goes to infinity, say x is your variable, then. Um, these guys are definable, so they can't really they can't really decay to zero. Like they can do a whole bunch of other stuff, but um, they can't like yeah they, they can't decay to zero. They are just zero from some point, and these are constants. And um, also also these are and these are discrete, right? Like these are point counting functions. They are either this, like they are integer, they are integer valued. So really, these are the guys that control um, this decay. And well, exponentials decay very fast. That's the. Okay, thanks. Um, and okay, so in addition to this ring of motivic functions, we also define a ring of um, okay, a ring of some functions we call formally non-negative functions. Um, the definition itself is a bit technical, but really these are just, these are very close to just uh, motivic functions with non-negative values, and you should think about these in that way. And I guess one of the most important properties of the ring of motivic functions, which I have mentioned, I guess, a couple of minutes ago, is that this is a class which is preserved on integration, so both um, motivic functions and this uh, C plus X, formerly non-negative motivic functions, both of them are preserved under integration. So say you have some function F and say I integrate out some variables, then given some, some conditions say that uh, whenever I plug in X 
inside the fear it is L1, um, I get that I have another motivic function which equals this integral. And, um, and this is very useful in particular, we use it when we take some motivic, some, some nice motivic measure, we push it forward, we get a motivic measure again, and then we can get all of it. We know, uh, we, we can do, we, we can say a lot of things about it and use the properties of motivic functions. And, um, okay, and this brings me to the second theorem that I wanted to show. And again, uh, jointly with Clackers and Itai Glaser. And it says that if I have some uh, formally non-negative function f on uh, x times w, and here both x and w are definable sets, then I have some constant c such that, ah, some constant and some formally non-negative function g such that uh, for any field, um, of residual, any non-Archimedean local field of um, residual characteristic large enough and any x such that um, this f function as a function of w, so if I really just like fix x and let w vary, then this guy is bounded on, so really just something like that, if this supremum is finite, then gf approximates the supremum of f of f. So in general, if I have some motivic function, I take its supremum over one of, I guess, the variables, I can get a function which is not a motivic function anymore. Um, I guess a simple example could be uh, something like the maximum between x squared and y cubed, this is not inside. So think about it as a function which goes from z times two points into z. And because in the value group variable, I don't have multiplication, then this is not a definable condition. So if I take the maximum of these two guys, I get something which is not a motivic function. And this theorem here allows us to approximate the supremum of a motivic function by another motivic function in a very tight way. And this is analogous to a certain result of uh, Clackers, Gordon, and Halupchuk in the case where um, we consider all motivic functions and not formally non-negative. And there they show something similar, but, um, but they have another absolute constant, which has to appear there in the case that we consider all motivic functions. And using, using this theorem, we can prove our main result. And before I move on to the proof, any questions so far about this theorem? Yeah. So was the F for me? Yeah. What? Okay. You said yeah, but maybe other people also raise their hand. No, I okay. Raise okay. Your okay. So, so in this theorem B, the constant C is it explicit in terms of I don't know the complexity of F? Uh, so this is this is a very good question. Um, it depends. Okay, so actually in the paper itself we have like this section which I think Itai really likes about um, really like what kinds of uniformity can you get like. Uh, where, like on what does this constant depend and for which families of motivic functions you can get a specific kind of approximation. And in general, in general, if you just consider all non, uh, all, all formally non-negative motivic functions, then this guy can depend on F. That's, uh, but, but, but you give some explicit bounds, right? I'm asking, I don't know. Do you give some explicit bounds? Like in terms- So in the proof, I don't, I don't think we give explicit bounds. Okay, but you believe it should be true? It should be- No, actually we give some bounds, but they're not explicit. Um, they depend on some, if I remember correctly, some finite set that we get through a different lemma of uh, Clackers, Gordon, Halpchuk. 
Um, what was your question? Is it again? I don't know. I, I think maybe I'm wrong. That for, so for these uh, formally positive definable functions, you can talk about the complexity of a function, right? So from f, you get some number, right? Some positive number. And then one may ask, like, okay, if, say, your f is not too complicated, uh, then maybe your approximation can be better, right? Or, or, or how, what's the asymptotics of this maybe, yeah. bound in terms of the complexity? Or, okay, never mind. Yeah, That's like an aside yeah, question. I, th I, think, I think it should be something like this. Yeah. But it should be what? The, something like the statement you said should, should be true, but yeah. you need to okay. say precisely yeah. what complexity means. And, okay. Yeah. But, okay. um, but, but in general, it's not an absolute. Okay. Yes. Yeah. But um, yeah, but okay. So we can talk more later and I can send you to the section with your name on it, I think, if this is interesting for you. And. Um, Okay, so now uh, using this approximation of Suprema result, we can show the main theorem. And so if you, if you recall the theorem was that uh, being FRS is the same as having um, age X, Y of Z mod PKZ bounded when we vary over the fiber Y over P and over K. And um, that this is the same as having this, these bounds on uh, the difference between the point counting functions. And the hard direction to show is that FRS implies something. And in the paper, we show uh, more or less this implication. But uh, here, for simplicity, I want to sketch the direction. So this was one, this was two, this was three. And I want to sketch the implication one implies two and this means that say your morphism is frs you want to show that the normalized point counting function is uniformly bounded in pk and y and um yeah and for small y for small primes p this is not a problem and let's see what happens for large primes p and um the note by rk the reduction map from y of zp to y of zp modulo p to the kzp. And for convenience, let's call this lowercase age function in a different name. And let's call it gpyk, because I want to treat it as kind of like a motivic function. And therefore, I want y and k to be its variables. And I want it to vary over my field. And uh, the first step in order to prove this theorem is um, to use the analytic criterion for the FRS property. So this result by Isabel and Avni from 2016 that I've mentioned before. And this allows us to show that this supremum of GPYK as a very over Y and K is uh, bounded by some constant which may depend on P. But uh, this still means that for every fixed field that I choose, this supremum is bounded and therefore I can use I can use my theorem B, and if you recall, this theorem B required that this supremum is indeed bounded, so therefore I did this step. And uh, theorem B allows me to find a formally non-negative motivic function G, which now is just a function on um, the positive integers. And this G function approximates the supremum of my lowercase gp, over YZP. So I get this kind of inequality. Um, GPK is squished between uh, the supremum of GP YK over um, Y and the same supremum times some constant independent of P, Y, and K. Now, using other results of Clackers, Gordon, Halpchuk on approximate suprema of constructible Pressburger functions, I can find the finite set independent of P such that the supremum of this large GP of K as a very over, um, over the positive integers is actually bounded by just a finite number of values. So application of GP on finite number of values. So this somehow allows me to, um, to control these like infinitely many values. And instead of thinking about infinitely many values, I can just think about finitely many values um, inside my finite set L. 
And now I only have to deal with finitely many numbers uh, in L. And for each fixed L, using some transfer principles for boundness of motivic functions, and um, this more or less tells you that for P large enough, you can think about um, you, you can think about Z, Z P mod P K Z points as the same as F P T modulo T to the power uh, K points. So it allows you to move from um, from QPs to FPTs or not QPs, but okay, fine rings of the first form to the, to fine rings of the second form. And the nice thing about dealing with these rings, this second kind of rings, is that we can connect them to the jet maps of uh, the jets of phi, so the jet maps. And by analyzing these jets and using the Langwell estimates for each fixed L, we can bound this supremum of g of a uh, small gp y l l here is fixed and because we know that the supremum bounds gp of k then we get a bound for gp of l and seeing like combining this all together this proves the theorem because we have our supremum, we approximate it by um, this uppercase G. This uppercase G using these um, approximate supremum results by Clackers, Gordon, Halupchuk can be um, approximated by finitely many values or bounded by finitely many values. And using Langwell and Jets and some transfer principles, we can bound that as well. And, um, and this, this proves the theorem. And yeah, so um, yeah, and I guess this is <laughs> this is what I wanted to say today. And yeah, so that's it. Sorry for the non-dramatic ending. Thank you very much. Questions, please. Ari, you have a question, you can just ask it. Yes, okay. When you say yes, it's not well defined, right? Maybe more yeah. than this. Okay, so can, can you go back to the main theorem, like theorem A? Yeah. If I can find it. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, great. So, so um, you showed us like, like at least one example where this theorem fails, right? Was a non-reduced example where you had many points. You had like P to the K points. So can you say something in general about cases where, uh, where, where this theorem fails? So for instance, in two, you can say something quantitative about how badly it fails, right? How, how big, yeah. so, okay. how, how too many points you have. And then I don't know if it makes sense, but can you say something quantitative about how far from being an FRS morphism can be? Yeah, so this, these are excellent questions. And actually, um, yeah, so we say a bit more, and this is a, a bit related to the remark I had here about epsilon jet flat and smooth morphism, uh, smooth morphisms. And really, we give a, s a similar characterization for, so, okay, so these um, epsilon jet flat maps, I can define a map which is epsilon flat if the dimension of x minus um, epsilon dimension of y is an upper bound for the dimension of my fiber. And if, uh, so, okay, so from this definition, if epsilon, a one flat morphism is flat and then I can define phi to be jet flat or epsilon jet flat if, well, every kth jet is flat, is epsilon flat, so something like uh, dim jk x minus epsilon dim jk y is an upper bound for 
Um, let me write it here. An upper bound for the dimension, I should write dimension here, of the fiber of the jet and for every jet and the reason that this actually comes- So what's K? So K, so if I is epsilon K jet flat? What's K? So for every K. For every K. Okay. Yeah, like, yeah, like these jets are something like, um, a general, like a Taylor approximation from of order K and phi, say that phi is epsilon jet flat, if for every K I have uh, this box inequality. And the reason that this comes into play here is that actually, um, if you're FRS, then you are one flat, one jet flat, sorry. And somehow, so, okay, so some of these, so this answers part of your question about, can I say something about how far are morphisms from being um, FRS? And we show a similar characterization of um, epsilon jet flat morphisms. And really this is something like, um, you have the same point counting function. So you say that the theorem says that phi is epsilon jet flat, more or less, I'm saving you all the quantifiers, um, more or less if this um, HXY of Z mod PKZ is um, smaller than Um, okay, maybe let me, ah, I thought I have another page here, which was just for these kind of things. Um, but let me stall time a bit longer until I find it again. Yeah. And here the bound is something like, um, Q times K1 minus epsilon times Dim y, but also we have a factor of of polynomial of k and the constant. So this is something like um, some, something bounded by also something logarithmic. And this is one thing. Another thing is um, is smooth. So you think this factor is in the exponent, right? No. This okay. So I should write it in a better way. No. Uh... This factor is just here, something like that. And again, need... when you plug in epsilon equals one, you need to get a constant, no? So when actually, actually when you plug in epsilon equals one, you don't get the constant, but you get, uh, you, okay, you get a constant for every K, um, but one jet flat is not a forest, it's something slightly weaker. So actually this means that um, more or less this function explodes, uh, but only logarithmically. And okay, so, but to answer a question, yes, we can say stuff about uh, when, um, like how far is a morphism from being FRS? And also we can say, okay, say we have a morphism, which is FRS, um, can we give better bounds depending on, um, like say the morphism, is, the morphism is very good. Can we say, uh, can, we even, can we even give better bounds? And we can do that as well by considering like these e-smooth morphisms, which um, actually generalize FRS maps in the other direction. So one smooth morphism, this, this has something to do with uh, the co-dimension of the singular locus in um, the fiber of the jet maps. And one smooth morphism is an FRS morphism and the larger E is, uh, the better the morphism is, and we can get a better bound. Okay, can you go down a bit so we will see this uh, bound? Yeah, okay, thank yeah. you. Just can I? Okay. Yeah. okay, and yeah, okay. Any more questions, I guess? I can just, yeah, so this is, this is the bound I was referring to. Uh, 
can I ask something? Uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, is there like a typical application of, of this kind of uh, relative setting where you, I don't know, you, you go from a, from a fiber that you have a good bound into a, into a different fiber and you learn uh, and you get a better bound or something like this? Uh, so I'm not sure about going from different fibers, but the application that we had in mind was uh, actually coming from a different work that we did about world maps. And really, if you have a morphism, then like you have a zeomorphism and you can consider this like the induced map on um, from X of Z mod PKZ to Y of Z mod PKZ. And this is just a map between finite sets. So you can just like take the uniform probability measure on X, on X of Z mod PKZ. And now if Y was actually a group G, then uh, it induces a random walk. Like for every P and K, you get a random walk and and th this improvement of bounds um, allowed us to say something about convergence of, like, about mix, uniform mixing time of, of uh, this family, this family of random walks. So actually, this is how. Um, th this is the reason we wanted to show, or one of the reasons that we wanted to show uh, this theorem. And so somehow, it, like, it complements, like, these previous results of ours about. Uh, random walks which are induced by um, algebraic maps. So the, 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 the point counting means what in terms of random walks? Um, so the point counting, so you have some phi from x to g, then for every p and k you get something like that. <laughs> Now, if you take the uniform probability measure here and you push it forward, then for every point, the density of this push forward measure will just be the size of the fiber, normalized, okay? And I guess normalized by X of. Okay. And, and this is really like the, this point counting function that we've discussed here and we can show that, okay, and we had more, more works on like this idea of convolutions. And at some point you, you can, so you can start with some nice morphism like this from X to G, you can do some process and you can get um, a morphism from X to the N to G, which is FRS. And also we can show that this process of like taking these convolutions agrees with um, the random walks um, the morphism induces in the way I described here. And, and then if this guy is FRS, then this really means that um, all, like this density is really, is really uniform in, in, uh, in the fiber and in P and in K. Um, and you can interpret it as, in, in terms of the mixing time of the, of like this family of induced random walks. This may this is clear. Or yeah, I more or less. Thanks. Can I also add something about this? Unless there are Sorry. more questions. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so just for uh, about uh, what Max asked. So also. I think another uh, uh, nice thing is the, is the method itself rather than the result. The fact that you can somehow uh, take a bound, that you have a bound which is dependent on P and using some model theory, you can, uh, you can erase this depend on, uh, depends on P. And this is somehow something that you cannot do using algebraic geometry. It's hard to do, probably very hard, but do not have to do it uh, using algebraic geometry and you can do it using model theory. And uh, an, an application for those kind of statements, so turning bound depending on P to bounds which do not depend on P, so there, uh, there could help a lot to Igusa type question, to question on, on uh, Igusa's conjecture on exponential sum, and all, there are all kinds of open question in this uh, realm that, uh, that we, are, uh, we, we think this method might help. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like the, the first thing we tried to do was try to improve it using algebraic geometry and we spent some time on this and really, oh yeah, it seem, seems either very hard or, okay, yeah, either very hard or not possible, but uh, so, and using this way of model theory, somehow you can um, overcome this problem. Yeah, yeah, and I guess this is all I, all I had to say. Great, thank you again. The next talk will be in two weeks by Dihua Jiang. Eyal, are you saying something? Uh, no, 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 uh, I just have to uh, hear a... Uh... Okay. Yeah, Ari, by the way, what you asked, so um, I think it's here. Yeah, so like we really had this discussion, so it, it was a really cool question because we really had this discussion about uh, how, like, what does it mean to approximate in terms of uh, how well can you approximate your family of functions if you restrict it in, in some way? This is a... so, you, so you ask these questions, like what kind of behavior of C you can expect, but, but you ask the questions, right? You don't give answers. Or, or you give it later. Yeah, I think there are some answers, right, Itai? But not for all. Uh... For the specific, so we know to, we know how to show that there is no absolute constant, like there's no uh, universal constant for all motivic functions in the world. This is just if you look at the proposition uh, three point six uh, downstairs a bit. Yeah, yeah and, this one. And there is a if you take x the maximum of x squared, yeah. y cubed, uh, z to the fourth power, and so on, z to the uh, fifth power, and so on. Okay, but can you go back to the to the types? Could you yeah. say it's a type three? So type three is universal. Yeah, okay. type three is a universal uh, constant, and it's it's yeah. basically nothing. Uh, so formally negative, non formally non negative motivic function do not satisfy a bound with respect to universal constant, and and uh, and you can actually construct functions which which gives where the only the best approximation possible is using a constant which is one, two, three, four, and so on. Uh, but the question you ask is really, really good because those counterexamples come with more and more variables. Like the, the counterexample yeah, which gives a constant yeah. of m is yeah. with m variables. Yeah. And yeah. I think uh, also we discussed this a bit with the uh, rough clackers as well. And I think there is a chance if you if you you need to define exactly what is the complexity that you want, what, what is bounded complexity, but some sort of this statement should be true that if you bound the complexity of the yeah. motivic function in some sense, you get. Uh... Yeah. So, for instance, in your application to these uh, warring type problems, this mixing time of groups. So, if you fix a group, then can you give like explicit bounds? Uh, or mm. it's an interesting question. Uh... Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Thanks. Very cool. Thanks for coming. So, uh, Yotam, I have a very naive question. Yeah. Can one very vaguely uh, interpret what you taught us in the following way? The eisenbot avni theory uh, gives us some bounds, but they are not uniform. So you uh, improve them first by um, making more explicit bounds. And then you use logic to say that the bounds you show are actually even more uniform than it seems because of some uh, 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 logical uh, or model theory. Uh, yeah, I think I think one can say that I like uh, I think that the, somehow it really 
I, I think about it as both generalizing like these two statements that I showed and and yeah here when, when we improve like the improvement on this theorem is really just by making um, is by making this get uniform but this theorem this like 2.4 doesn't have a statement um, of of this form so so yeah like the bounds are more um, more explicit and in the absolute case like and if you consider the improvement from the from the absolute case yeah I think this is it then uh, yeah you have similar very similar bounds but they are just not um, uniform like there is no fiber just the scheme so I think seems like Titai, do you agree yeah I mean it's it's okay I think the way I like to think about it is, is like that you have a machine this model theory theoretic framework gives you a machine to translate non-uniform bounds uh, over uh, like you, you have bounds which are uniform in y and in k but not in p and you have uh, which comes from Eisenberg and Avni and you have bounds which are uniform in y and in p but not in k and this is by uh, by uh, applying long whale estimates to the jets and the model theory allows you to somehow take these two statements and, and make them it's impossible to get a motivic function which has those two kind of uh, uniformities, but which are not uniform in themselves. This is somehow the, the idea. So yeah. it, it, it actually tells you that the same bounds are already uniform. You just didn't know about it before using model uh, theory. In some sense. I mean, you don't have an explicit the bounds um, in some sense. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And okay, thank you. Yeah. And, and also maybe one last word is that Rami really likes this philosophy that there are, um, there are some tools which all, like they always seem to solve the same problems. And these are like a model theory, resolution singularities and D modules. And somehow these are very different, but they can, in many cases, they are used in different ways to solve the same problem. So this is also some of the- How are D modules related? What do you say again? How are D modules related? So also you can you can also use the modules on I think uh, like uh, analytic continuation uh, yeah like to the lambda types okay I don't remember but uh, you can think of the integral of x to the lambda mm -hmm. uh, yeah. of the f to the lambda where f is a polynomial and lambda is some complex number and you can try to analyze it using d modules using resolution singularities and using model theory and there are three approaches that are now somehow connected together, but, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, they, they give similar solution. And here it's somehow, it's, it's, it's a use of, of model theory that does not have the counterpart, does not have the algebra geometric counterpart somehow. So th this is, I think, uh, yeah. Yeah, and it started, and, and what Rami and Nir did in their paper was using resolution singularities, but it didn't work in a uniform way because of like some bad behavior of uh, constructible sets with respect to taking points over like Z and ZP, but you can solve the same problem in the relative, also in the relative setting using model theory. So this is also an example of like uh, these two, two different tools solving things in the, somehow in the same zip code, problems in the same zip code. Okay. Okay. Nice seeing everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Wait.